Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Courtside with Beelance and Tennis, part of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. We have with us today a USPTA master professional and seven-time USPTA national coach of the year who has trained five world number one ranked players, Andy Roddick, Jennifer Capriotti, Maria Sharapova, and both Serena and Venus Williams. All tennis fans are excited to see the upcoming movie titled King Richard, which comes out on November 19th which tells the story of Venus and Serena. And it stars Will Smith as the role of their father, Richard Williams. Steve Flink and I are pleased to welcome to the pod, Rick Macy. Rick, thank you for spending time tonight talking to us about your background in the movie. No, I'm glad to be here. I'm, I'm off the court, I'm all yours. So that's uh, fire away. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all getting fired up to see the movie in November 19th, and we're gonna get into that in a little bit, but um, just, current status how are things going on your front right now no everything's everything's amazing um you know i still this is crazy i still teach over 50 hours a week um you know privates i'm probably the busiest guy in the country i teach seven days a week all ages all level uh still turning out national champions i i still have the passion i get up every day at 3 30 um i actually this is an amazing story no 3 30 for the last 25 years it's a, I, I picked up a racket when I was 12 years old um, in Greenville, Ohio, a small town in southwestern Ohio, and I taught myself how to play. And by the time I was 18, I was like number one in the Ohio Valley, and I grew up in a park. So what's crazy is I lived a half mile from the park. Now here I am in Boca Raton, and I live a half mile from the park, and it's kind of the crown jewel of Palm Beach County. And the name of the tennis center is Rick Macy Tennis Center. It looks like Disneyland and Candyland. I mean, Kenan practices there, all kinds of pros. I mean, the place is uh, rocking and rolling. Every weekend we have a tournament, prize money tournament. Uh, it's amazing. So it's kind of come full circle. But at the end of the day, I'm still the same guy from a small town in the Midwest and love what I, want, love what I do. And I still have the passion. So that's the most important thing. Yeah, we, we, we hear that passion coming from you. It's so awesome. You know, it, it seemed like you started your academy pretty early in your teaching days. How many years did you teach before the academy started? And then what kind of gave you the impetus to start your own academy? Well, a great question. You know, early on, like in my early 20s, I, you know, I, I knew I had something because I like to analyze things and I could connect with people and communicate. And I knew I wanted to get into teaching. Unless you were going to be really great, there's no money in, in tennis. So I got into teaching early on, and but I knew uh, this is what I wanted to do. I just love helping others more than help myself. And uh, as time went on, it was like, you know, maybe 1985, I journeyed down to Florida, and I went to a place called Greenleaf Golf and Tennis Resort. It was like in the middle of the Orange Groves. They were building convention center. They had already had a good golf course. And Steve will probably remember this. They had a tournament called the United Airlines Sunbird Cup. I mean, Absolutely. Martina played, Tracy, Andrea Yeager. So I went there, and it was, a, it was an opportunity um, to kind of build and create things for the corporate structure and kind of make the resort a vacation destination. So I was all into that. I took it to one of the top uh, resorts in the country, one of the top grassroots programs I put together for adults. So I just always like building and creating. But the teaching, there wasn't a lot going on uh, at that time in the early 80s, people visiting. So I would teach adults, but I was mainly running a lot of tournaments. And then in 85, um, this was in Haines City, Florida, uh, a doctor named Wrong Dad Ho brought his nine-year-old son to me named Tommy Ho. And he was nine years old. He had two other brothers. And it was kind of crazy because he had this crazy grip like he was playing ping pong. And but I said, wait a minute, that that kind of looks like a liability. Then after a while, I said, that could be a weapon. You know, it was kind of so as time went on, I said, I think I can make this kid a player. So to fast forward, he became number one in Florida in the 12s. Uh, he won every national junior tournament, singles and doubles. He became the most dominant junior player, better than Sampras, Agassi, Chang, won more gold balls than anybody. Youngest ever to win Kalamazoo at 18. He was a 15-year-old. And so, because back then, people said, 
well, maybe this guy knows what's going on. So Stefano Capriotti brought his daughter to me to kind of show her how to serve because she kind of served like Chrissy, just kind of get it in and da, da, da. And I changed her forehand or serve and serve by saying, this guy's smart. So more people start coming. And I said, let's start an academy. So that was like in 85. And uh, what's really crazy is in 88, Tommy won the nationals as a 12, as a 15 year old in the 18th and Jennifer run the 18s as a 12 year old and yeah, both those rec no that's crazy i had the daily double you know i had the daily double and that those two records still stand today you and had the daily double in the 18s when they were both super young that's just 12 crazy. and 15 and so from that you know i've just been doing the same thing i just reload restock and here we are what 30 40 years later i still do the same thing i actually teach even more uh privates and uh I love it just as much now as I did then, but that's how it got started. But other than maybe IMG or even uh, Hopman, I'm probably the last of the Mohicans. The thing about me is I've kind of done it by myself. There's no big entity behind me and it's more personalized, but I drive the engine because I'm one-on-one -on -one and I teach anybody, anytime, anywhere. Rick, it's interesting. You talked about getting up every morning at 3.30, which reminds me a lot of Nick Politeri. He's renowned for getting up at the crack of dawn and before. And same with Brad Gilbert. How much sleep do you get a night? How are you able to be so productive and, and spending that many, 50 hours, as you said, a week with, with all of these players and, and, yeah. and do it on so little sleep? Do you get four or five hours a night? Well, to tell you the truth, this is kind of out of my comfort zone talking to you guys at seven o'clock. So my routine's kind of changed tonight. But no, I usually uh, I usually go to bed around eight nine o'clock, and I'm up at three thirty, and I'm I'm fine doing that. You know, you become a creature of habit. You just get uh, into into a structure. I get up in the morning, I run a half mile, and I'm actually I open up the park at at sixty six years old. I'm a park ranger. I'm putting that on my resume. I I opened up uh, the park every morning. And, uh, you know, then I'm on the court at six o'clock because we start early before school. So um, like anything in life, there's good habits and bad. And um, when I get up, I'm just I'm just ready to go. And I think when uh, you can lead by example and be a role model for others and stuff like that, and that comes across in your teaching, uh, that's why I'm still going strong. You've been blessed with good genes, man, to be healthy enough to, to keep doing it all these years as well. Um, yeah. I want to touch on something. I know Steve's going to talk about this a little bit as well. Um, the people I listed in the intro, the Roddicks, the Capriati, Sharapova, the Williams sister, uh, the Williams sisters. Obviously with Jennifer, it was something really obvious because she was so young and she went pro at 13. And like you said, she was winning the 18 nationals at 12. Um, yeah. Is there something that you see you know, Tommy Ho, who was an unbelievable junior, like you said, didn't quite make it as the names that I just mentioned. Was there Correct. something about the names that I mentioned that um, you saw that said, you know, whoa, this is something that we we got a potential champion here? Now, it's a great question, you know, and I tell everybody you can't judge a book by its cover. And, you know, also in that list is Sophia Kennan. You yep. know, I had Sophia from age five to 12. And that's really when you put Humpty Dumpty together. You know, and they have these things that last a lifetime. And, you know, I had Mesquina at 17 years old. I mean, she won the French. I had Mary Pierce at 16. So I did have other players a little later on. But at a young age, uh, the one common thread, well, there's two. Uh, mentally, they were a little different. Okay. And it just the way they were wired, you know, um, that they they just were there but that that you get that later i didn't see that in serena at 10 years old i didn't see it in her then because she was more happy go lucky a little prankster kind of goofing around a lot but she wasn't mature enough but i saw it in kennan and i knew if i could teach her the geometry of the court and, and under just understand how to take the ball early because she wasn't going to be that big and she's like five six 125 um but she had amazing hand-eye coordination. I taught her how to cut the court, the geometry, just shorten up the strokes technically. Um, and the same thing with Sharapova. You know, I had her at 11. I mean, her forehand was a nightmare. I actually switched her to play left-handed. And her dad, this is a true story. Her dad, we were going to switch to play left-handed. Then the IMG boys came in and said, wait a minute. 
Uh, I don't know if this is a good idea. I made her forehand better by switching her to a lefty, but I made her backhand worse. But it was crazy. Um, so, but mentally they had something. And it's a package, as Steve knows. It's not just one thing. But if you got that mental box check that you can just plug in, that's the number one thing. I saw it in Roddy. And I saw it in Venus and Serena. But then the wild card is this. Everybody I just mentioned, their ability to compete, okay? Uh, and Serena would run so hard, and she would almost fall down to get a ball. I mean, both Venus and Serena were another level. Roddick was like that, too. He had some limitations a little bit, in my opinion. But anybody, anytime, anywhere, and all of them had this thirst for competition. And everybody's competitive, but it was just different. Then if you can get a world-class serve biomechanically or just make sure something's not a liability, as you go down that yellow brick road to the pros, you don't have these holes in your game. But that's the one common thread. Now, I've had that in other players, but maybe they had other limitations. You know what I'm saying? So, But the ability to compete like no other, anybody, anytime, anywhere, and just mentally, especially Sharapova. I mean, she was, cause I felt she had li limitations. But she was like in a bubble at 11. But that doesn't mean she's going to be a world-class player. But when you're right here, right now, and Chrissy had that, as Steve knows. I mean, it's just like, bang. And that can come later because your brain's not fully developed. You can't reason as a kid. But some people never get it, you know. And so those are the things I look for. But at the end of the day, the Williams sisters, they not only checked all the boxes the way I looked at it, they even created a few new ones that were going <laughs> to transcend the game. I just had to make sure the arms and legs and hair and bees weren't flying all over the place. <laughs> yeah, that a, That's incredible insight. Yeah. And we're, we're going to get into um, some of the coaching methods, um, especially with Venus and Serena, because we know that um, how good they were. They did not play a lot of junior tournaments at, no. at all. Um, I guess talk about some of those methods that, that Richard used and maybe that you and Richard discussed and why it was such a, a different journey, but at the end of the day, so successful. Yeah. You know, it was like when I, uh, you know, when I got invited out to Compton, uh, I never heard, I never heard of them. I was at the Easter bowl. I had about 25 kids there and an agent from advantage international, which is now Octagon came up and said, there was this little girl in the New York times called Venus Williams. And you should like take a look at her. You know, I never, went to see a player, a junior player. They either came to the academy or I saw him at a junior tournament. So one day I get a call from Richard Williams and he said, uh, he introduced himself, nice guy. He was cracking a lot of jokes. He said, we live in Compton. Uh, I didn't know nothing about Compton other than what I saw in the news, you know, rioting and all kinds of crazy stuff. And he goes, we'd like you to come to visit. And I said, well, I never really visit. He goes, Rick, Rick, if you come to visit, I promise you won't get shot. OK, I, this guy was hilarious, you know, and I was just going, OK, it's May. And, you know, Jennifer was gone by then. She, she was like on the pro tour, I think 14. And so I said, I'm going to jump on a plane. I'm going to L.A. and go to Compton. So I went there and uh, that night they came to the hotel. Brandy, the Orsin and Richard and Venus Serena. I can remember all this stuff like it's yesterday, especially since the movie now 30 years later and came to the hotel. and. Venus was on one leg and Serena was on the other leg and her arms were around Richard and Richard grilled me like I was in a deposition. It was like, because I think, but I respected it because he wanted to know if he was going to let someone maybe into his circle because they probably had not a lot of friends, but just acquaintances. And I actually respected it. So Venus, Serena, we talked, we laughed about, it. they just kept staring at me. And so we met for two hours. So the next day they go, we're picking you up at seven o'clock and we're going to practice at East Compton Hills Country Club. I go, no problem. They pick me up in that bus you're going to see in the movie. And I go into the bus and this is crazy. I sit in the front seat and I get harpooned in the buttock. There's a spring sticking up. There's about four months worth of McDonald's wrappers in the back. There's old clothes. There's tennis balls. I mean, it looked insane. There's Venus and Serena are sitting back there. The bus is wobbling and he goes, we're going to East Compton Hills Country Club. And I'm sitting there going, this is like, I'm in a movie. This was like, remember, I'm at Greenleaf Golf and Tennis Resort as a director, a five-star resort, the Le Mignon, 
And now I'm like, this is like, this is very different. So now we're going, and I'm, after about 10 minutes, I'm going, it's a strange place for a country club. You know, and he goes to this park and he pulls into this park and there's about seven in the morning. There's like 25 guys playing basketball. There's people passed out in the grass. There's people drinking. We get out of the bus. We have to go through the basketball court to the tennis court. There was two tennis courts. It looked like a bomb went off. Then that is this, you wouldn't play on it. Okay. And the basketball court parted like the Red Sea. And they go, hey, Richard. Hey, King Richard. Now, this was in 91. They called the guy, the guy King Richard. And I'm thinking, this is kind of, and they go, hey, Jamaica, because Serena's middle name is Serena Jamaica Williams. Then they go, hey, VW. They, all these people just parted. Went right through the, these guys. <laughs> it's like all kinds of cast of characters. We go onto the tennis court. Okay, I had a brand new box of Wilson balls that I had shipped there. He goes, Rick, 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 we don't use new balls. We, we want old ones. I want the girls bending and digging them out. I'm going, okay, well, sounds good to me. I got it, but it was a little different. We go onto the court. He has a basket next to the post. It had about seven chains wrapped around the basket. It was Rick. Got to secure it. It'd be gone in the morning. <laughs> so it took him 20 minutes just to get the cart ready for the old balls. So I start hitting with Venus and Serena. So you got to remember my blueprint, okay, is probably the greatest junior ever in Jennifer. I mean, she, the ball was like on a string. She was prepared, you know, she had her knees bent in the parking lot and her racket back already from the late, great Jimmy Everett. Okay, so her fundamentals before she came to me, I had to change her forehand because she didn't have top spin. She kind of had side spin like Crispy, Chrissy. She had no serve. So I'm thinking, we start doing some drills. I'm going, what in God's name am I doing in Compton, California on a weekend? I saw Venus Serena. They were like maybe 50, 60, 70 in the nation. Not any better, not any worse. And this went on for an hour. Because remember, Capriotti was poetry in motion. Great techniques, low center of gravity, early preparation. But it's a great lesson for any coach or parent or even Rick Macy. You don't judge a book by its cover. The cover could look amazing and the book's crummy. The cover could look, you know, bad and the book could be unreal. So now I said, let's play some competitive points. Because Serena, she wasn't at Venus's level yet. Venus was almost 5'10". And Richard goes, you ready for this? And I said, I'm, I'm always ready. I don't have to get ready. He goes, I like that. I like that. So we started playing competitive points, me and Serena against Venus. And right then and there, the whole landscape changed. I'm going, this is amazing. The footwork got cleaned up. The preparation was a little better. The burning desire to get to the ball was brutal. It's something I never saw. I never saw two little kids try so hard. Now, you could try hard and still work at Burger King. You know, that doesn't mean you're going to be great. But I never saw two female athletes try so hard like a Doberman pincher was chasing them to get to a ball. And it was like, whoa. And then Venus had these long legs. And it was almost like, God, she should be doing track and field. I was going to tell Richard, maybe it's the wrong sport. I just never saw people try so hard and move like that. Technically, it was a mess. They were, like I said, arms, legs. They had the beads then. They were coming flying off the court. It was improvised city, you know, tentacles flying everywhere. But everything got cleaned up. And right then and there, I went up to Richard and I said, let me tell you something, because it was more about Venus. I said, you got the next female Michael Jordan on your hand. And he put his arm around me and he goes, no, brother, man, I got the next two. That's, that's the famous the line in the trailer. Said, of the movie. No, that went global. And then Venus walked, goes, daddy, can I go to the bathroom? And they were always kissing and hugging, very close-knit family. I was very impressed. Venus went out the door, and for the first five maybe feet, she walked on her hands. And then she went into like backward cartwheels for five. And I just, right then and then, I went to Richard. I said, listen, there's a lot of work to be done. Tennis has never seen this. These two girls can transcend the sport. And Steve knows this. Back in the 90s, if you were big and strong, uh, you weren't very nimble, okay? 
like I could go list a lot of players. So they were going to bring speed, quickness, okay, agility, okay, size, and they could move like the wind. But the wild card, so competitive yeah. to go for the. So I'm sitting there going, they just need technical help they need financial help they need opportunity hitting partners and you know the rest is history but well, uh, david oh, go ahead, rick, about that ricky you know I, I it's fascinating the way you describe that their evolution and and your your uh initiation with them but what i'd love to know is and it's hard for you to heap praise upon yourself but obviously richard was a genius of sorts and or seen as well but they needed technical guidance for their daughters. There's no doubt about it. anybody in the tennis community would say that, and you provided it. Can you talk about how you shaped what you did in terms of improving their stroke production? Because you've already alluded to the fact that, 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 that it, was, it was a very unconventional picture and the athleticism was there, but maybe the tennis part wasn't. Can you just talk a, in a little detail about how you went about that with Richard's approval? Because I think you played a, a critical role with them and it's not talked about enough. Yeah. You know, the story, the story can always sound better from Compton to center court. You know, I get that, but you know, there was a reason when they made the decision. Okay. They visited Greenleaf in July and they made the decision in September to come with me. And, you know, I went, I went all in, you know, because Richard needed a job, you know, and, uh, uh, so he got a salary at the academy. He got paid like fifty-four thousand a year. They came from they came from uh, California. They got a ninety-two thousand dollar motor home. This was the peripheral stuff: a condo at Greenleaf, you know, health insurance, food. So the peripheral had to be restructured because they moved the whole family to train with Rick Macy. Okay, then the tennis part um, is four hours a day with me. Okay. They had individual hitting partners. There was Taekwondo, boxing, ballet, uh, you name it, I was all in. Because to me, there was no risk, even the financial part. You know, and I'm not an IMG or a billion dollar corporation, but it didn't matter what the number was. Uh, and probably the, the biggest thing was my time besides the hitting, because the, the, the grooving that had to be done and the technical part, and this pretty much went on, Steve, for four years. Okay, they no matches, hibernating at Rick Macy's Academy, like the late great Bud Collins always used to say, they were just hibernating. Um, and but I was all in. I didn't matter how it affected my business because I was on a mission, and it didn't matter what they got to play against people that would like crush them like a grape if they did play matches. They always played boys. They played people better every day. And when you're with someone four or five hours a day, five days a week, four hours on Saturday, um, Venus and Serena were like my family. And Richard was my best friend. And, you know, he said many times it was me and him against the world. And so when I'm doing what I got to do, and it was, it was difficult because technically when you're dealing with athletes and they can improvise, and I think people don't realize there's not a wrong way or a right way. Sometimes there's a better way. And so, but I not only train the kids, I train the father because Richard had his own ideas about stuff and I would go in there and kind of clean it up. And that's the art of coaching, you know? So, and people said, dealing with that for four years, I should be in the hall of fame just for <laughs> dealing with that whole thing. Let me forget there's a seven time thing. So, uh, but no, you got to understand when you're not keeping score, and you do it because you love it and you're just all in, um, it's, it's a different thing. I was on a mission and, and I did an interview. It's actually on YouTube. Uh, it's an hour and a half about the whole thing we're kind of talking about. But what's interesting about this is when there was so much media involved in this, and I'm not talking US, I'm talking global. When you have Rick Macy uh, saying, she'll be better than Capriotti, or she'll be, they'll be number one in the world. And the little sister could be even better. And they live in the same house. Just from a business point of view, that puts zeros uh, into the equation. But this is all going to come to a head eventually, because eventually you got to play. You got to play. So for three and a half years, all we did was train. 
And we throw away that, we throw around that number three and a half years. You take that times 365 days, that's, that's a lot of time. Or you talk three or four years, that's a lot of time. You know, but people don't realize every day, the personalities, dealing with the cast of character, the hitting partners, uh, just everybody involved in this and to keep my hands around the whole thing during a very uh, uh, crucial time. Because the cards you're dealt with, Steve, at a young age, you're pretty much dealt with for life. That muscle memory is baked in extra crispy. It's hard to change it unless you can reverse engineer a lot of this like myself. So what happened then, we're going down the yellow brick road. The girls are getting better. Um, and in 1994, the WTA changed the age eligibility rule. And it, they call it the Capriati rule, which was they don't want kids turning pro, as you remember. So I told Richard, okay, Houston, we have a problem. So now we either got to turn pro or Richard, you're going to have to wait and just play three tournaments, three tournaments, six tournaments. Then at 18, you can go as hard as you want. And so we had to make a decision based on that ruling. And so Richard goes, because I knew he would. He goes, okay, then she has to play. Because he didn't want anybody dictating to Richard Williams what the amount was going to play. So now here we are. This was like July, Steve. So now she's almost forced to play. Because before it was kind of, she ready? I didn't know what was going to happen. So we get her a wild card into the Banco West Classic in Oakland, California. Uh, I think the year before there was 22 media credentials given out. This year there was 252. It's like Elvis left the building. It was global. It was insanity. Okay. I didn't know what was going to happen. All I know was this. They were going to see a little girl from Compton, California, five foot 11, runs like the wind, a lot of open stance, a lot of firepower. I didn't know, Steve, if she was going to shoot missiles from North Korea all over the place and lose O and O. I didn't, but I yeah. knew people would say, that kid's going to be great someday because you don't know what people are going to do mentally. Even today, you, you don't know what's going to happen. So, so she, we get there. All right. And uh, this is a great, this is a great story real quick. I had Gerard who was a hitting partner. Uh, he played like Davis cup for Congo. He was like four, uh, 400 in the world. Venus never beat him in three and a half years. Never think about it. You lose to someone every day. Venus would go, Rick, I'll give you $5 if you let me beat this guy. So the day of the tournament, I told Gerard, make it go into a tiebreaker. Let her clip you at the wire. Because he's always like, he could, he could turn it on and off and just roast her up. So they get into a tiebreaker and Venus wins the day of the tournament. She comes off the, the court. She goes, Rick, Rick, I'm peeking at the right time. I'm peeking at the right time. And I'm just sitting there going, yeah, yeah. So I wanted that confidence up there. Yeah. And she went into the match that night against Sean Stafford. And, you know, she won 6-4, 6-3. Shocked the world. Think about it. No tournaments. Yeah, I want to, Rick, if you don't mind, I want to I want to um, interrupt you just yeah. to go a step back there. You know, you've had so many great junior kids. This was odd to not have them play junior tournaments for, what, three and a half years or whatever. Like, what? Yeah. Did you agree with that um, method with with Richard? I don't know yeah. if that was something that you came up with on your own just because of all your experience with other kids, but that's so odd. I think a lot of yeah. listeners of this, a lot of tennis parents are interested in, in that theory. Well, no, it wasn't, it wasn't my idea. It was Richard's. Uh, and I think that's going to come out in the movie. Um, he, it was pretty much, he, he, he didn't want them to play because he always said this is about pro and he had his reasons and he goes rick if i go to junior tournaments i'll probably end up in jail that's what he <laughs> said to me he goes this is crazy i don't want to get involved in that and so that was the reasoning and you know i thought maybe they could have learned more okay uh but the one good thing about both of them they're just so brutally competitive you know some people need to compete to just feel the pressure, learn how to win and lose. So it didn't freak me out because they were just so competitive, but it was very unconventional, but that was his idea. I don't recommend for any parent to do that. And I yeah. think some people- I mean, just from, just from a, a, the outside looking in, competitiveness is one thing, but you have to play matches to learn how to win, to learn how to 
um, deal with pressure situations and to not have that is, is crazy. And yet they were so, so, so successful. But that could cut the other way too. Maybe you play so many tournaments, you try not to lose to try to win and you, you never develop. See the one thing people, I remember one day Venus playing and she was 12 years old and a lot of agents were there and USTA and everybody. And she's shooting balls everywhere. And when they all left and we we're in the park and I think of Rick, she's not as good as everybody says. They're looking at the wrong movie because they, they're used to seeing someone like Jennifer put every ball in and Venus is missing a lot. But you know what? You can see it loud and clear now. And Rick Macy knew this, that the number one thing to me and not only life, but sports is to have courage. These kids had no fear. And I think that comes loud and clear as you look through their career, how clutch they were still pulling the trigger. And it's an intangible thing. Everybody gets nervous. Everybody choked everybody but they made more error especially venus and than anybody i had but they were positive errors so the tournament thing can actually hurt you a little bit if you overdo it in my opinion because you can kind of get caught up in the wrong thing so it cuts both ways rick at what stage in in that four-year stretch richard is famous obviously for, for proclaiming that serena was going to be the better player and yeah. obviously, that I always and so two things about that. Did how was that hurtful to Venus in any way to have her father take a stance like that? And secondly, did you believe the same thing? First off, great question. Venus never it never phased her at all. Okay, and and it's amazing. These kids are like two peas in a pod. Even today, I just never seeing like it because there's all kinds of reasons why that could implode. And it never, it never was like that at all. Venus was always the big sister. She's the little one. And Richard, probably when it was about 12 or 13, then he started saying it, that Serena will be better. And he'd go, and there's nothing against Venus, but Serena would just be better because she's just more like a pit bull. She gets a hold of you. She's not going to let go. You know, it's more that he saw. Now, regarding Rick Macy, I would have taken the bet. OK, early on that there's no way Serena would have been better early on because she would like, Dad, my knee hurts. And then five minutes later, he go, my knee hurts. And she grabbed the other knee and I'm sitting here going, but she's 10 years old. So she she, she wasn't as stick to it as Venus. Venus was more mature at a young age. And for any coach or parent, you, you, like I said, you, you got to you can't judge that part of it, you know. But once Serena mentally started to mature, all those attributes, I could see that she possibly could be better. But I need to clarify something here. Mm. I, I still today, and I told when they did the GOAT about Serena, I told uh, Zena and Shanda this, I really believe that Venus would have became, would have become the best player of all time. And I think she'd have won she won more grand slams than even Serena has now. If she would have continued on the path that was kind of laid out when she played Sanchez as a 14 year old, she went to the net 33 times when she beat Novotna at Wimbledon, she went 35 times. She played Steffi early on in her career and she was in the thirties. Venus would take the second serve and come in the other the opponent. The minute you're off balance, Vina was at the net. Her vertical was so high, it was hard to lob her and her wingspan. But what happened is she got on the tour. She thought she could, in my opinion, out athlete people by running around. She could. And, you know, even when you're nervous, you can win like that. So I don't think her attributes given from above were taken advantage of because she could have taken second serves, been at the net like Martina. She could have changed everything because um, she had something that Serena didn't. She had that jumping ability and wingspan, and she loved to attack. So early on in 1992, Angela Buxton, uh, Buxton did a story on Venus. We practiced two hours a day on grass. People didn't know that. I worked with her two hours a day on grass, and I said, it was a 91. I said, this girl someday was going to win five Wimbledons. It's right here in my office. Here we are 30 years, 30 years later, 
she won five Wimbledon. And I said this when she was 11. When we trained on grass to shorten the backswing, get lower, a good volley would be great, a bad volley would be good. So these are the things people don't understand. But I really believe Venus. Uh, maybe if there was no Serena, Venus might have 30 grand slams. But then again, they go hand in hand. Mm. But great question. Perfect. Let me ask you, that's a great answer too. a fascinating response. Don't you think though, from my standpoint, as, as a long time observer, I always felt that technically at the net on the, on the conventional volleys that Venus was better than Serena in that capacity. I mean, we could break down their games across the board and you'd see Serena is, it had a superior serve in my view, first and yeah. second. Don't you yeah. think that this, was actually better at, at, at the conventional punch volleys, leave aside the swing volleys. She always seemed to be, me, to be more comfortable up there, and you seem to be backing up that point. Absolutely. You know, and more importantly, even if you don't volley, if you're in someone's face, uh, that, that you can win the volley without volleying, you know, and her wingspan, and you cannot lob the girl. I mean, her vertical, going, like I said, the next female Michael Jordan, I mean, and, but you don't, you never really got to see that. And she could have been at the net. It's easy to Monday morning quarterback. And I don't want to do that because she's one of the greatest ever. And I love both the girls, but that was the only thing. It seemed like that changed a lot from the plan early on because I was, you know, out of the picture after 95. So listen, at the end of the day, uh, you're right. Uh, Venus was uh, amazing at the net. You never got to see it enough, but Serena did have one thing. Even when she was little, and I told this to everybody, uh, Serena had all the time in the world. It's an innate quality. Hingis had that too. Serena has a lot of time. Um, and even at the net, she had more time. Okay. And Serena was the best athlete I ever coached. I can say that very clearly. And so people don't realize how those little intangibles go into that package to make someone great. It's not like, oh, Sampras had a great serve. People forget how good the guy moved. You know what I mean? I mean, people only look at what they want. And so, but you're right about Venus. And I'm glad that you recognize that because if she would have played mixed doubles or more doubles, I mean, she would have broken every record. But in singles, I, I think uh, there was a lot there. That could Rick, have been, you know. I, I, with, with all your experience, I, I want to ask you this question. Um, you know, you look at someone like Sebastian Corda and you look at his parents, his parents, they have what? They got two daughters who are all world golfers, one of the best golfers in the world. You got Sebi Corda who's got an unbelievable future. Um, you've worked with so many kids. You've worked with so many parents. Um, you know, we've talked with what you've done with Richard. You know, for people listening to this that may have a child, you know, looking at playing, you know, whatever level, high ranking junior, collegiate pro, um, what is your best advice that you can give to parents to allow the children, to allow their kids to flourish? First off, a great question, you know, because everybody thinks it's a uh, race to the finish line. And when you get into this, it's junior development, not junior final destination. And everybody thinks it's a race to the finish line. It's not where you start, it's where you finish. So the first thing is, you got to remember this should be fun. Okay. And when the parents get out of control, I just say, well, let me ask you something. What did you do at age 12? And the conversation, I, I just kind of changed the whole landscape of how they're feeling because they, they didn't even play. I mean, because you get so immersed into this thing and it's, it's a journey. And I could sit here and rattle off, you know, a hundred people who were of 200 people are number one in the 12s or number one in the 14s, or even 50 or number one in ITF 18s. And you're going, who are they? Okay, I could, I, if someone said this, I could say that. It's just a long-term process. You want to have fun. But I just had a, before you guys, I did something with someone from Indiana, uh, a Zoom video. And the advice I gave them, make them the best athlete you can. You know, do a lot of other sports, you know, play tag, you know, do agility, do Taekwondo soccer make them the best athlete because there's going to come a time when it's all about hitting balls and repetition it was a five-year-old that they're asking me my advice on this and i said you got time don't worry about it i could tell you stories it's about some of these young kids 
So that was it. You make them the best athlete because when you're off balance, out of position, are you going to be able to deliver and hit it in the corner? Or do you got a lob like the rest of the world? And that those intangibles separate sometimes great from good because great is rare air. I mean, that's rare air. And these, your ability to improvise, and Steve knows this well. I mean, this is people don't understand. You know, we just say, oh, it was a great shot. But why was it a great shot? Why can people do those things? And it's all that genetic background. It's all that DNA. And, but it also can be enhanced. So, but people get so caught up in the wrong thing, just hit more balls, more balls, and you need that. But in tennis, okay, especially at a young age, developing the athleticism would be the number one thing. But to back up to, to what you just said, this is, this is a great story. And I got to tell this just real quick. When Venus and Serena were 11 and 12, we got invited to Hilton Head, South Carolina to play an exhibition. So we went there. Richard would play an exhibition, but no junior tournaments, okay? He'd go for the filet mignon, but no hamburger. So we go there, 5,000 people, family circle cup. We're like the opening act. We're playing two people, both of you have heard of, Billie Jean King and Rosie Casals. So we got Venus and Serena, 11 and 12, against Rosie and Billie Jean. So, and Venus and Serena are standing like closer to the service line to return serve than the base on. And Rosie, they're looking at him like, should we tell them where to stand? No, they're taking the ball so early and they're hitting the ball right at Billy Jean, hundred miles an hour. And it's like, it was crazy. They didn't know how to play doubles, but they knew how to fight. Like it was a, just a street fight. And the way Venus Serena just hit the ball and were all over the place, it was crazy. So now they're playing two of the greatest doubles players ever. We get in the van to go back to the airport. So I'm sitting next to Serena and Richard and Brandy in their front seat, and Venus is in back. And all of a sudden I hear, hey, Venus, how did you play today? Then I hear, very good, I played good today. Well, how was your volleys? And I'm going, what is this? There's Richard, there's Orsine, there's Serena. I turn around, Venus is talking to a doll, and she's asking her how she played that day. So the moral of the story, to answer your question, and Richard knew that I knew this, their kids first and tennis players second. No, that's, that's great advice. Um, this is a fascinating discussion. I know it's late for you and you got to get up in a couple hours. No, and listen, so early. no, no. Um, for, for, for you guys, that's why I'm doing it. It's, not, it's fine. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm good. Steve. I mean, is there anything else you want to, you want to hit at while we have Rick? This has been a very <laughs> insightful conversation. I, I, I I just would want a, a little bit more. How much pride do you take, though? You've, you've been great at describing the past and your contribution, but do you, do you uh, how 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 do you, how just assess what you did for them versus what you did for all these other great players that you've mentioned? Is that do you see the Williams sisters as sort of the central one of the central features of your coaching career? And are, are you most proud of the work you did with them, given the circumstances of Richard bringing you these two young, brilliant athletes that you had to shape? You had a lot of work to do in, in terms of a making lot. a tennis player. So do, do, you, do you single that out among your experiences? Well, you know, people ask me all the time, like, who's the favorite, my favorite student of all time? And I tell them that's easy. But whoever on the other side of the net, that hour, okay, that second, okay, that minute. So, and that's really how I feel, you know, and that comes across in the teaching. But to answer your question, the Williams situation was very different because there was literally millions, not just in sweat equity, but hard dollars from 1991 to 95 put into the project. This doesn't happen without money and sweat equity. We had contracts and that's a whole different discussion and, and so on and so forth. And that all eventually got worked out. I didn't do it to like become more recognizable because I was already like, you know, well on my way with Tommy and Jennifer. So I did it because I knew that I could help transcend the game. I was a visionary. Um, so yeah, obviously became, they became two iconic people and we knew we could transcend everything. Um, sure, that would be the staple people would look at, but I think the dynamics of that is different and it's probably more personal because I had to fund the project you know, with the whole family, not just from the outside, but from the developmental point. Because listen, you mess up a few things, 
you could change history. You change career. So this didn't happen by drinking the water. You know, this, this, there was a lot more into this thing because Richard and I were on a mission. We were best friends. Uh, you know, in another interview, he wrote me a letter and it just crystallizes everything, me and him against the world. Um, so yeah, when you're all in and you, uh, you know, you love what you're doing and you love the people you're with. And this is all, hey, listen, they could have got injured. This could have catastrophically blown up. But when she won that match against Stafford, okay, then almost beat Sanchez. She's up 6-3-3-1. I'm sitting there with Bud Collins. He goes, forget the 69 Mets. Forget Rocky Balboa. I mean, you walk off a street, you enter a pro tournament, you play no matches, and you're beating number one in the world. He goes, this will be the greatest upset in the history of sport, any sport. Well, Sanchez did come back, but then and there, I knew that this little girl was going to get eight, 10, $12 million contract, which she did. And Amazing. The, the, the rest is going to happen. She's going to be uh, the next great American tennis player. And her little sister might even be better. Amazing. Rick, this was a, yeah. uh, this was a fascinating discussion. Thank you for, for your time. This was, uh, oh, I appreciate this you was having definitely me on. enjoyable for Steve and myself. Thank you. Well, he yeah. made, I just want to say he made our job quite easy tonight. I would say because yeah. because guys, Rick, it, it's, it, you're expansive in the in the in the best sense of the word because you could anticipate where we wanted to go with yeah. these questions and it, it was a it was a joy having you on no i appreciate it we'll do it we'll do it again and i feel like i'm on the court still you can kind of tell i'm fired up about it yeah november 19th king richard make sure everyone checks it out it's going to be great thanks again everybody